Mick Jagger være? Delicious. Thank you so much. All right. There's a disclaimer. I have, whenever I do a mural, towards the end of it, when I get tired, I go the opposite route. I get a ton of energy. I have been speaking to seniors all day, so I'm lit right now. Like, I am ready to go. Um, so we're going to see how this turns out, and I think it's going to be fantastic. Uh, thank you for that storied introduction. Really appreciate that. Let me set this up, and we're good to go. So yes, my name is Jeff Govea, spelled exactly like it doesn't sound. It is very difficult to craft a brand around a name that nobody knows how to spell, but that's OK, all right? We're here. We're doing it. I am very excited to be, be here with you guys. I wanted to, wanted to talk about things that I don't think most artists uh, speak about. I'm not interested in telling you about my inspirations, my motivations, my ideas. I'm more interested in telling you about the practical side. This is legitimately the only formula you need to make money in the creative field. This is it. Goes like this. Make cool work. Show it to cool people. Meet new people. Do it again. And then die. All right? That's just, that's just how it goes. That is the formula. So our outline today. Number one, how to make money. Number two, how to get gigs you actually want. And number three, how to get better. Like I said, I'm not going to be speaking about my ideas, my motivation, my inspiration, because it's completely and utterly irrelevant. There's no, there's no reason. Are we, <laughs> what's going on with the lights? It's OK. Are we, if we go just like, can we go half, half on? Have you guys seen Arrested Development? Hair up, hair down, glasses on. Uh, OK, that's, that's perfect. That looks fantastic. So the first point on how to make money as an artist is to become the ice cream man, all right? got to become this guy. And the easiest way to understand that is this abomination, thick Pikachu. All right, this is thick Pikachu, Pikachu. This abomination. You all weren't expecting that first thing. All right, how to hit him with the thick Pikachu. Thick Pikachu was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to my studio in the last year. I help out at the Grove Community Church in Riverside, California. Uh, about halfway through the year, a meme account started following me on Instagram, started interacting with my work, and they started saying things about the Grove. But it was, it was a meme account, and so it, was like, it had like 40,000 followers or something. So I knew it was one of the high schoolers. And I was, I was impressed that he, he had built a, a following. And then I saw he had built a merch page selling thick Pikachus. And I have never been more proud of a senior high school student in my life because this illustrates my principle so well. The ice cream man does this. Well, I, I, can, I don't really want to take it off the screen. I just, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> the ice cream man does this. The ice cream man sells a specific product to a specific audience. The ice cream man, when he comes around your street and he's doing that song, I really don't know how to, how to do it. It's like, dun, 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 dun. I, I don't know. It's the ice cream man song. And if you want ice cream at that moment, you're going to reach that homie. You're going to run out there and give them your $2 and get your drumstick or whatever. Side note, my mom never let me buy from the ice cream man. We don't trust him. But become the ice cream man and sell your product to those that do trust you. The thick Pikachu is obviously a crazy product. It's a Pikachu with gluteus maximi that are just glorious with like really amazing thighs. It is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, and he sells about $1,000 worth of these a month. And you're like, what, how? He commissioned an artist through Fiverr in Thailand to create the 3D rendering, and then he prints out the 3D models and ships them all around the world. <laughs> It's, it's the best example of what the internet is, and yet so many of us in this room would kill to make $1,000 a month selling whatever we make. Consider thick Pikachus. But the thick Pikachu is really just a style. It, it, it's a style. It's a specific thing that he has crafted, and he's selling it to an audience 
that really wants to consume that. So the common questions around how do I make money, the next one would be, well, how do I get my own style? And then how do I become known for that style? And it's, it's really, really simple. You already have a style, whether you think it or not. And it might not look like this hammerhead shark with like a gold chain and uh, playing futsal. That's weird, that's my style. But you guys do have a style that each one of you, when you speak, your voice has a distinct sound. And that translates into your hand. It, it really does. And, and though it's not refined yet, it doesn't mean that you don't have a style. So how do you start a style? Well, actually, first off, what is a style? Honestly, it's just this. Repetition and commitment to finding yourself. I think that that is the clearest way that you can find a style and also the fastest way to do it. You, you will see what, what, you, what you vibe with, what you don't vibe with, and then edit that stuff out and then commit to putting, putting it out there. With the senior meetups that I had this afternoon, which I loved, like I really, really loved those conversations and had a great time doing it, common things were, were coming up. That even as seniors, we're still having issues with basic principles. And it's not, it's not their fault, because it's a common thing that, that everyone across the spectrum has. And it really does come back to the ability to be in your craft every single day. If you have to put it at one thing, it's being in your craft every single day. And the way that you find a style is exactly that. So how do you begin? Where do I begin? Where do I begin? And I would say you start at the beginning. The piece on the left was the piece that I entered into the student art show in 2012, and I lost everything. Like, I didn't win any awards. Nobody even knew what it was. It sucked. It was terrible. I don't even know what it is. It's like a guy doing like a, like a just something like this. Like, I don't know, I was just, just sending it. I really had no concept of what it was, but I knew that when I painted it, I was like, Jeff Govea painted that. You know, that's, that's, that's what the whole mark was. And I, and I put on, on there, so you guys could see, that it got a huge 15 likes. <laughs> you start at the beginning. Like it doesn't matter about the, about the accolades or if your work even looks good. We can all agree that my work in the beginning is not great. Far from it, quite terrible, but you have to start, you have to start somewhere. This, this one on the right was one of my first murals that I had done. I had negotiated with my friend who owned a barn to let me paint murals on it. And so this is kind of like a quick side note because people ask me all the time, how do you, how do you get murals? How do you do murals? Um, nobody, nobody's willing to um, give me space. Why should they? Why should somebody give you a wall? Like, that's audacious to just even say. So you have to figure out a way to, to get it. In the beginning, I was doing a lot of pieces uh, unsanctioned, if you will, um, for the city of Riverside. I was going to a lot of uh, abandoned warehouses and under uh, structures and things. What was already bombed and graffitied, I was then putting my flavor on it and creating characters. There was one night when I went out to paint. Um, hey, don't worry about it. It's OK. Um, <laughs> I went out to paint in this uh, concrete structure. I had found it on the street. I was driving by. I was like, this is great. This is exactly what I need. I took my friend Colby. We went out to the, uh, the structure. And we're painting in the night. It's, it's a full moon, so you can kind of see. And I'm just like practicing some of my figures in spray paint. and then. Out in the distance, like we see the red and blue um, light up, and it's coming towards us. And then um, I grab him, I grab Colby, and we jump underneath like this, because it was like concrete structures. And so we just jump underneath, and the cop car is like going around. And in my head, I was just thinking exactly what my then girlfriend, now wife, had told me. Maybe you shouldn't do illegal things. And she was right. That's why I married her. But it was, it was in that moment that I realized I should probably not be painting illegal things. This is, this is just not the path I want to go down. What I later found out was that that concrete structure was where the Riverside police uh, practiced their SWAT team um, activations. So I was on uh, not only Riverside Police Department land, but I was on federal land. So I missed the sign that said huge federal offense, like now entering federal property. So I don't do that stuff anymore. But 
I negotiated for this barn, and that's really the beginnings of um, painting legally. Um, I don't paint illegal anymore, officially. Um, the beginning when you're making money, you have to start charging something. And this is a quick side note on pricing. And I'm trying to get like the very basic things that you guys want out of this. Does my mic keep going in and out? What do I need to do to change that? Just freaking, just send it? Okay, all right, we're good. Just persevere with me, okay? Persevere. I, I wanted to get out as quick as possible to just address the money issue, the pricing, because some of you guys sitting here, this is all you really need. And I wanted to get to you as fast as possible. So the way that you get good at pricing is you need to charge something. <laughs> So you, you have something, let's say a mural. We'll go back to the murals because that's the easiest thing for me. That first mural you do, that first legitimate mural, you just ask for them to cover supplies. Jeff, I want to be paid for my time. Of course, you do. Yes, I get that. And we'll talk about that later. But you have to start somewhere. And so you need to prove that you can do a mural. So you get the supplies paid for. Then what you do is you go to another business and you say, hey, I just painted this mural for this plant shop over here. Can I do one for you? It's worth $300. You don't, you don't have to say that you weren't paid by the other one, but you, you, just, you just put a price on it. If they say, yeah, no problem, you know you charge too little. If you say $300 and they're like, totally, you know that you probably could have charged five. But you can't backtrack and be like, well, actually, it's, it's $500 because that's, you know, like, just eat it. Eat it, move on. The next one, charge 500. And when they're like, no way, that's so expensive. Will you do 425? And you're like, okay, sure. So at least you learn. But then on that next one, say 500, and they'll say yes. And so then like, it keeps going up. But if you notice a cap, like I started to notice with my work and working with coffee shops, was the cap was $425. So it didn't matter whether I did a shirt, a mug, gave the owner's mom a massage. Like, it didn't matter what I was doing. Like, I was only going to be paid $425. That's the max that I could have made at a coffee shop. I don't know what it is. Maybe you guys can make a little bit more on the commissions within it. But this, the coffee shop is the modern-day skate shop, in my, in my opinion. They have really low budgets, but they're willing to do a lot of merch items. It's a good place to start. That's just free tip for all of you. But the budgets are not very high. So then I thought, well, what if, what, like, do you guys like this? I, I drew this, and I'm like, I get paid to make drawings for a living, and this is, like, the worst one I've ever done. But I had to do this on the plane. I had to get this. So I wanted to transition from coffee to soccer. I wanted to transition from coffee to specific. You guys are like, oh, a soccer ball. <laughs> but you know what? Like, I could have changed it, all right? I have the ability to draw, but I don't need to prove anything to anybody. I'm doing it. I'm my own man. I didn't know at the time that I wanted to transition to soccer, but I thought, okay, I'm doing a lot of work for these coffee shops. I'm doing shirts. I'm doing mugs, stickers, graphics. Um, it wasn't just in the Southern California area. I was getting paid from sh some shops up north, uh, like around here, um, on the East Coast. So I was, I was doing well within the coffee scene, but it just wasn't, it wasn't that much money. So I, I thought, well, what, what could have a larger budget? And I was actively looking for that. And what, what I stumbled upon was actually my first passion. This lopsided kid is me on the Rattlesnakes. That was my first team. My dad was the coach. That's what's up. Football is life. I'm wearing a shirt that says Oakland Roots. I'm not from Oakland. That's just the name of a team in Oakland. I was in Oakland yesterday, and the team gave me this. So I'm just like, all right, I'll wear it. It's free. That's what I want. You can go ahead and lower the volume. This was in 2014. <laughs> So that was me sweating, sweating it out on Copacabana Beach in Brazil for the World Cup in 2014. As a football fan, we knew that Brazil was going to be the mecca. That if you love soccer, you could not afford to miss the World Cup in Rio de Janeiro. You could not. You could not afford that. So we sent it. We did it. My wife is 
an amazing woman and she let me go for three weeks, less than a year after we had been married. She did not come with me, she did not wanna go. She just let me go with my friends. I don't know how I lucked out with such a wonderful woman, but she let me do this and we sent it. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. When we were in the country, this is when it started to click. Brazil is light years ahead of the United States in terms of culture within the beautiful game, within soccer. But it was everywhere, it was on every advertisement, on every bus station, on everything, and I got this vision of what my life could look like. But I didn't really know how to speak that language, speak the language of transitioning from coffee to soccer. And I also didn't know how to speak the language in Brazil, Portuguese. I can speak a little bit of Spanish and my Portuguese is really, really bad. But we went, we got tickets. The way the World Cup works is you petition for tickets ahead of time and it's basically a lottery system. So we were able to get tickets in Belo Horizonte, which is about eight hours north of Rio. So we took the bus to, to Belo Horizonte, got there really early. Now, one of my friends, the night before, we, we weren't like really partying, like that's not really our scene, but we, we had some street vendor drinks out, out in Lapa, and he did the classic international mistake, he drank with ice. So the ice, what they use is they, they, they chill their water that's contaminated, and it, I mean, not contaminated them for them, but for like people who aren't used to the, those cultures in the water, um, you can get sick. So homie Bradley is looking really pale. I mean, he's already pale, he's like 100 pounds, he's, he's just a little guy, but he was looking really bad when we got, when we pulled the bus in at 6 a.m. And we're like, oh, let's just go to a McDonald's, let's go to the McDonald's and get him some food. So we're in the McDonald's and he puts his head down on the, on the table after he orders, and then all of a sudden he lifts his head up. He's like, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm like, all right, go, go ahead. So he go, it's a two-story McDonald's, which is weird. I don't, I don't know why it needed two stories, but it had them. And Bradley goes down the stairs and he's gone for a little bit. And then one of the Brazilian McDonald's workers comes up and he's just saying something to me in Portuguese. I have no idea. But I know he's saying amigo, which means close to amigo. And that is very close to, that, he's talking about my friend. He was asking me like, Basically, what's up with your friend? And I thought he was, because he had like cleaning supplies, and I thought he was like talking about like, oh, you know, your friend's in the bathroom, and I'm trying to clean it. Like, I didn't know what he was saying, so I was like, ah, oh, I'll go down the stairs. My friend Bradley is sitting at the bottom of the stairs, and he's just like this, and there's a line of poop on the ground. <laughs> what had happened was Bradley, when he went down, had passed out and had, um, let it go, and it was all over the floor at McDonald's. And the guy is like trying to console him and like trying to <laughs> console me. I have no idea what's going on. And then we have to, it was, it was I, don't, I have no idea how I got him to a hostel, how I got him back to health. I don't know. The other guy we were with was like, it's the Zika virus. Homie knew about Zika two years before you all did. He was like, it's Zika. And I'm like, there's no such thing. Then it became like a huge thing. He's like, I was researching mosquitoes. But anyways, we got him to the hostel, we were able to clear him up. And my, my problems with um, the language didn't stop there. When, when we got back to Rio, I was trying to buy groceries, and I asked the woman, like, Tem huevos, which I said, do you have testicles? And I, what, I had asked, what I had wanted to ask her was if she had eggs, and she just laughed at me and like, just gave me this like, look like, what's going on? And that wasn't the last time that we, we had that, that language barrier. When I went the, it's towards the last day, and I'm about to go to Sao Paulo, the rest of my friends are about to go back to the States. I got this like pretty rad internship for the week in Sao Paulo. Um, that's a totally different story. But we're eating at this place, and by then my Portuguese had progressed past Tem Huevos, and I felt confident to order without the menu. So I thought I was ordering Pizza con carne, which is pizza with some meat on top of it. But what I really ordered was pizza j carne, which is pizza made completely out of meat. <laughs> so they brought back a pizza, no joke, like two inches just thick of meat. And I didn't want to tell the, the gentleman, like, this is not what I ordered, because it was exactly what I ordered. And that first bite I bit into it, I knew I had made a mistake. So I'm lactose intolerant, but I deny it. And at that, mo that point, I knew I was lactose intolerant. And also, pizza jacarne intolerant. 
I got on the bus to go to Guaulos, which is like six hours south of um, Rio, and then it's about an hour taxi ride into Sao Paulo. So I'm trying to throw up the entire time I'm on that bus because it, it hurts. Like it, I, I don't know what's wrong. I'm hurting. I'm alone. I'm scared. Um, this older <laughs> Chilean woman gave me a, uh, like a sweet, like a, like a candy. She, was just, she became my grandma. She, she, I just looked terrible. And I was like trying to throw up, but it couldn't happen. And I thought, okay, like I'm going to be able to keep it down. But I just felt bad. So I, I get out to the taxi station. I, I meet up with a, a, a guy. I, he says, I look Chilean, so we start talking in Spanish. Um, he's going to a near destination that I was in, Sao Paulo, so we share the taxi. We get in the taxi. I close the door. The, the taxi driver starts the car, and all of a sudden, he smells like bacon. He, like, he just smelled just like bacon, and I just rolled down the window and just threw up out, outside of the window. And that, cold, that was like the perfect example of because I couldn't speak the language, I couldn't articulate what I wanted. And when I couldn't articulate what I wanted, I got what I had asked for. And this is my roundabout way of saying you get exactly what you ask for. In the creative field, you get what you ask for. And if you cannot articulate it, nobody will give it to you. This is something that, that I really noticed when I, was, when I was speaking with the seniors today, is we do have this, this, this problem with saying exactly what we want. We say things, and they don't mean exactly where we want to go. So the way, this is a side note, the way that I think that you can overcome that is to know yourself. The way that you know yourself is through writing. I think writing is the foundation of all creative pursuits. I really believe that. I believe that writing is the number one way to grow as a designer, as a photographer, as a human, just, just anything. If you know yourself, you'll know what you want, you know where you want to go, you, know, you want to know what to ask for. My wife, this is us in Norway uh, this last summer. Uh, she is a speech language pathologist. She's way smarter than I am. But she works with, she works with students on their speech language goals. And one of, the, one of the groups of kids that she works with have um, moderate to severe um, disabilities with, with speech. And one of the boys that she was working with can't say, can't say anything, doesn't say anything, doesn't communicate at all. And the goal, because I was asking her, I'm like, that's, that's got to be incredibly difficult. What is the thing that the parents want for that child? What is the one thing? Because they know it's not going to be like a, a normal life. That, what is the one thing that they want? And she said, my wife said, they want to be able to communicate with yes or no questions. Because then it would allow them to have some system to create. And what my wife was able to figure out with the help of one of her colleagues is that the boy, well, he can't say anything. The homie loved chips, like he loved like potato chips. And so my wife gave him a keyboard, and he was able to type chip, like without prompting. Like he, could, he knew what it was, he just couldn't say it. And then once they had that communication, he started asking for talkies. Like he, just, like he was asking for specific types of chips. Like unlocking the ability to communicate, it's such a powerful thing when we can articulate, this is what I want. You know, and that's an extreme example that this boy will now be able to you know, like they'll, they'll have some semblance of communication, which is amazing, but they're able to communicate. And the questions that, that come about from this is, well, how do I even find the people to ask these questions of? How do I find the people who can unlock these things? Let's say I know how to articulate what I want. Who the heck do I tell? Because it's not my roommate, because they don't care. How do I pick a market to focus on? Like, how do I, how do, I do these things? Well, let's learn from this crusty guy. So this is Mark Twain. <laughs> Mark Twain, he wrote for the Sacramento Union, I believe is what it's called. I always get it mixed up. It's like either the San Francisco Chronicle or the Sacramento Union. But in, in his early days of writing, he was a really bad journalist because he would get bored and he would make stuff up and embellish the stories and just create what he wanted ultimately. So he was getting really bored on the job. He was working for the Sacramento Union. And there was the first ocean liner going from San Francisco to Hawaii. So he wanted to document this cruise that was going to happen. It was the inaugural steamboat cruise that was going to go across. He pitched that to the Sacramento Union. Sacramento Union said, no. He missed out on it. A year goes by, the second voyage. Mark Twain pitches it again. 
The Sacramento Union this time says, all right, we'll pay for your way. So he goes to Hawaii. And when he gets to Hawaii, what he doesn't realize is about three weeks earlier off the coast of Chile, because of the way the currents push, the USS Hornet had caught fire and sank. And about 30 crew members are now drifting towards Hawaii, unbeknownst to Mark Twain. This serendipitous moment, this crazy story of how the, the boats are, are huddled together. There's three boats. The captain, in order to save them because their rations are so low, straight up cut the other two, let them fo float off, and the captain had to keep going. Like it was this crazy story of a borderline murder and starvation, and the, the crew lands on um, Hawaii. Mark Twain is there, tells that story. He sells it back to the Sacramento Union, and this is what he first starts speaking about starts his speaking career, which launches his literary career, which is why we read Huckleberry Finn in fourth grade. So who do you ask? You ask whoever you have access to, and you just articulate it. Now, could Mark Twain have understood that this voyage was going to change his life? No way. But he had the courage to ask. And the, my favorite part is he asked again, because that first time they said no. So going back from coffee to soccer, the thing that I have been wanting to do forever, forever, the, the vision that I had was I loved murals on vertical surfaces, but I've always known that the potential to paint on the ground is the untapped market. Everyone in here knows muralists that do walls. How many of you know people that paint on the ground? It's a very, very small percentage of you. So just based on on market share, on the ability to like close in on a market, to become a one of one. If I start painting on the ground, I can become known. So I pitched this in 2017. This was to Adidas. They were flying me out to Chicago with, a, with a, another company. And I was like, OK, they just released the Nemesis and the X line. It was going to be dope. Um, this, was, this was kind of the idea I pitched, like two figures on either side. They had no idea how I was able to do it. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. I had no idea. I had no idea if it was going to be safe. I had no idea if we could like, do this in a public space. I, I don't know. But I just pitched it to them. And they responded with, no way. Like, that's way too hard. That is way too hard. We only have like two weeks. If you start working with big brands, you'll realize they do everything so last minute, it's crazy. Like, they'll hit you up and be like, we need this by tomorrow. And you're like, OK, I thought this would you know, at least give me a week. But with this, it was just too hard. So the project died. Instead, I went out there. And instead of doing the thing on the ground, I did a six by four foot canvas. And I felt like an idiot. Like I'd gone all the way to Chicago, wasn't really making any money on the deal because I had dropped my rate so low to push the, the court through. So I'm flying across the country, basically on peanuts, to paint a four by six painting that I thought was going to look stupid. And I didn't really like the way it came out. On the back end of that trip, I was going to go to Philadelphia and then New York. So Philadelphia, I was going to paint for this company called Live, Breathe Football. And that was where I was like making some of my money. They were, they were giving me like a, little bit, a little bit of money to, to cover the majority of what I was doing. But the reason that I really went out there was to connect in New York. And I had this vision of painting for this freestyle competition. And when I got there, it was nothing like my vision. I was, I was supposed to be drawing on, on glass while the freestyle competition is going on behind me. I felt so poorly about it, I didn't even take a photo. I don't have a photo of what I did. There is supposed to be a photo in the middle of the main reason why I went, besides the, ver the, the horizontal surface, was to connect over this freestyle competition. And I thought I had bombed it so hard. But what happened in that freestyle competition was I met this guy, Zach. And Zach had dropped in my ear, you know, Adidas is looking to revamp the outside of this building. And I was like, OK. I mean, that's like pretty much all he said. I was like, can I get your number? And then he just gave it to me. So I'm like, OK, cool. And I, I hounded that guy as soon as I got back. Even though I felt like a fraud, I felt so dumb for doing this, this trip, making like nothing. It wasn't anything what I told my wife it would be. Like, I just, I just felt like a fraud. But I got back and just really started to follow up. And then that's what led to my first mural with Adidas. First actual mural with Adidas, it was 20 feet high by 120 feet long. And they paid me very well, and I was able to have an amazing start to nonstop collaborations with Adidas for like 
18 months straight. It was, it was crazy. I went from like doing nothing for Adidas to doing like a project a week for them because they just kept kicking me stuff. Like once, and what I found out is once you're in with the company, they don't, they work so last minute that they really only work with the people they've already worked with. So that's, that kickstarted something. So then when I'm doing the, the project for Adidas, I'm like trying to, I still have this in the back of my mind, like this is it, this is the one, this is what's up. So then I pitch it in 2018, the beginning of 2018. They're like, no, we don't really have a use case for it. It can't really happen. So then I go to the opening of the LAFC game. Uh, Adidas had um, asked me to paint something for their suite uh, out in LA for this team, LAFC. And uh, this is my wife and I at the game. Probably you want to lower it a little. Let me get rowdy. So behind me, behind that beautiful mouth, is a guy named Rob. Uh, Ellie from Adidas said, hey, you need to meet Rob. I think he might be interested in your, your, your court project. I was like, all right, cool. Turns out Rob is in charge of US Soccer Foundation. And their main initiative, and I knew this, I just didn't know it was Rob, is to put in 1,000 small-sided mini pitches around the United States by 2026. And they had a project coming up in Watts, California, that they needed somebody to paint on the ground. I didn't realize was how difficult it was going to be to paint on the ground. I went there thinking, okay, I'll get my scaffolding up um, 12 feet high. I was going to have Jake right there. That's my boy Jake. He does all my videos. I was going to have Jake standing there just straight up like, I need you to love me style, just <laughs> with, the, with the projector pointing down. And I was going to use that. I was going to angle the lens so that I could draw. As soon as we started that, it didn't work. I like, I, when I get nervous, I get like, I sweat a lot. So all of a sudden I just, no, Siri, I just said sweat a lot. I don't, okay. And so all of a sudden I had like no clothes on because it was just so hot. It was 11 o'clock at night and I'm freaking out and I'm trying to keep it together for my team because I'm trying to be a good leader and not just say like, I want to quit because I did want to quit, but it was exactly what I had been asked for and I had gotten it. So I needed to persevere. And it was a much more difficult thing than I had anticipated, but I learned a ton. I was honestly a little disappointed in the way it turned out. If you look at the characters, they're skewed. And, not, and everything I do is skewed, like they have super long limbs. But if you look at it, it does look wrong. Like it admittedly does look a little bit wrong. And here's Adidas, US Soccer Foundation, paying me real money, pinning the whole project on me to be able to pull it off. And I really felt like I didn't pull it off as well as I could have, because I just wasn't I had never done it before, and it's, it's paint that costs like $125 a gallon, like every, <laughs> it's just stupid. So I learned a lot from that project, but it didn't deter me because this is exactly where I wanted to go. And this is kind of where serendipity starts to play, play in, and I'm weaving it back to the Mark Twain story. So around this time, we start releasing these types of videos on my Instagram. We, we, we call them hidden camera skits. And they do really well. Like I get like six to seven times more views based on, on these videos. Um, they're loosely based around art. Here's another one. I love this one.
So, <laughs> so then, <laughs> have you guys ever had a speaker show these kinds of videos? Then we posted this one, and then, yeah. Can you believe she left me on red? <laughs> And we tagged, we tagged the Riverside Police Department. And we said like, hey, Riverside, please put a stop to these guys. And then they responded, so wrong, being left on red is the more serious issue we need to address, can't even. <laughs> and that day, that day that I posted that, the guy who was coming to my studio, I had just done a shirt for. I had just done a shirt design, it was a back hit. He was paying for a local high school soccer team. They had just won CIF, which is like, I, I don't know. I don't think they have CIF here. I'm pretty sure the C stands for California. Anyways, <laughs> they definitely don't have CIF here. It's like, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just high school. They won high school. Anyways, I did the shirt for him, and I, I, I charged him nothing because he's the head pastor of a church, and I'm just like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to charge him anything. I didn't really want to do the shirt, but like, he seemed like a nice guy, and that was cool. So he was coming by the studio. He, was, he also asked for like the actual drawing, which nobody ever does. And I thought that was super weird, but I just said, okay. Um, you know, because I usually do like just digitally and it's like pieced together, but I made something for him. So it was a little bit more work than I wanted, but he came to the studio and he saw this, this thing that I had just posted. And he's like, oh dude, that video you posted, it was super funny. Um, I used to be with RPD for the last 15 years and then I became a pastor. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's, that's rad. And then he's like, well, if you ever want to go up in the helicopter, like, let me know. I, I have so many connections with RPD. If you, ever, if you ever need that, let me know. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And as he was leaving, I was like, actually, I'm trying to do this project where I paint on the ground. I don't know why I said it. I was just like, I'm trying to paint on the ground, like the ground. And he, because every time I say it, they're like, oh, you want to paint large? Like, you want to paint the side of a building? I'm like, no, the ground, the ground. And he, and he said, okay, let me call my dad. Turns out his dad's the councilman of the district. Calls his dad. His dad's walking down the street. No joke. Like this little little man just walking down the street comes into my studio. He's like, "How's it going? I'm Councilman Melendres. I'm the councilman for this area." I'm like, what the heck is happening? Like everybody's in my studio. What the heck is going on? And then he's like, "Yeah, we're we're revamping Bobby Bond Skate Park." So this was the project I finished on Friday. Pretty large. They greenlit the project. They believed in the vision. The city of Riverside was down. The church paid for the supplies, and I got my proof of concept. As I'm painting this project, the thing that I'm working on with Red Bull, they're like, well, let's, let's do something with this. Like, let's fold this into something in the future. So I needed a test case. I needed a voyage. I needed to go, I needed a story. All the serendipitous things that came along the way, all these, all these years of like trying to get this off the ground, and I do this project, and now I know things will open up. So tomorrow when I get back, we're starting on the basketball court over to the right. That's the second one. I throttled it that way on purpose, because there is something to be said about momentum. When people feel like you're absolutely just crushing it, doing project after project after project, they want to kick you more things. People always bet on the winning horse. Like the horse that looks like it's already winning, they want to put more money on it. So how did this come about? Well, I did it for free. I didn't make any money on this project I just finished on Friday. None. And my wife, every time I do this, this work for free thing, my wife looks at me, and now, now she understands like how it pays off, like why, why it actually makes sense. No company is going to trust that I can pull off that massive of a painting, unless I do it. Now, I didn't lose any money on the project, and I spent about $3,500 in paint. So, like, I think I'm okay on that. Like, I spent a lot of money, like, to be able to get this off the ground, of the, of the sponsor's money. So that did take some work to, like, get them to sign off on that. But I didn't personally make any money on it. But I know for a fact 
I will get more projects like this. Yesterday, we were in Oakland meeting with the Roots, trying to do one of these at four tennis courts in the middle of the city. I'm trying to work with Target. I was just in Minneapolis a few weeks ago. They, Target does this sort of thing for MLS All-Star. They haven't done it like this, and I've been trying to tell them this is what's possible. And, and when I was like, I want to paint the ground, they're like, you mean the side? I'm like, no, the ground. We're going to paint the ground. So I was able to text the creative director of the drone shot, like, hey, look at this. This is the vision. And he's like, that's dope. Text the contacts from Adidas. Text the con like, it's just all full circle. Of you have to be able to show your vision, and now the wheels will start turning. Now it's possible. The third thing, and the final thing, like what this all culminates about, is really this talk is about discipline. This talk is, is about the concept of showing up tomorrow. When I interned for an artist in LA, his name's Stephen Harrington, he does a lot of work with um, like hype beast stuff, like uh, streetwear. And I asked him, like, what, what's, what's like the secret to making a living in the art world? And he said, honestly, just be around next year because your peers won't. So if you have the tenacity to be around tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day, your peers are going to fall aside. Nobody I went to school with is actually making work. Nobody. I was the worst in my class in high school. None of them are making work. It's really hard. But if you have the ability to be disciplined, to show up, to keep doing it, money will come. I, I promise. And the, the question around this is, well, how do I get better? Because I don't just want to keep showing up and, and not get better. And really the answer to that is falling in love with the unremarkable. The unremarkable, the, the unsexy. Right now I'm going through this book. I'll pull it out. Oh. It's a book on figure drawing. It's not good. But this is like my sixth one that I've, that I've done. It's just Richard Hatton's figure drawing. I don't know, it's old, it's whatever. I'm learning about anatomy, trying to get better with that. Reading this every single day for 30 minutes is making me better, even though I don't really love it. Like I love how in the weeds it gets. Like today we're learning about how the, you know, the deltoid connects here and scaps, like all, all that stuff. So that's great. And the most awkward part is when I'm reading about figure drawing in the, in the coffee shop and it's just like butts for days. And then everybody walking by, I'm like, I swear, I, this is not what I do, but I'm getting better. I'm falling in love with the act of learning, really falling in love with that, falling in love with the act of grinding in drawing. My creative practice looks like this. I show up to the coffee shop, I order something, I sit down, a 10 minute timer starts. I write for 10 minutes. I try and hit 300 words. It's doable. So most of the time I'll hit like around 400. End of the 10 minute timer, which I always write to the same playlist. It's Vitamin String Quartet's uh, cover of Cigarros. So you take a really weird thing and then add, add violence to it. It's like creative. Then I do a 30 minute playlist that's uh, Vitamin String Quartet covering Bon Iver, like their, some of their stuff and I read to that. And when, that, when that's done, it starts a new 25 minute timer that I'm always changing the songs to, um, but right now it currently starts with Megaton Mile by Local Natives and ends with Middle Child by J. Cole. So it starts soft and then it ends a little bit hard. Uh, it's so that I can just keep up the pace. But I do this every day, no matter where I am in the world, that's my creative practice. If I do that, I'm an artist for the day. And really, your input is your output. Whatever you're putting into yourself, you will get out of it. If you're putting discipline into it, if you're putting in good habits, if you're constantly learning, you will have good, nuanced work come out of it. It's like every single person in this room understands fitness. We all do. It's not difficult to tell me how to get a ripped body. It's not that hard. You know that in order to lose weight, you need to eat less than you're spending in calories. So if you're in a Caloric deficit, you will lose weight, just guaranteed. That's just a fact. And the way that you get stronger is you go to the gym. <laughs> that, is, that is just it. But those two facts are, are things that when you look around, like, well, we all don't buy into that. That's not something that 
that we're doing, because that takes discipline. That's a, different, that's a different input. But if you can change your input to focus on the most simple things, if I draw every single day for 20 minutes, I will get better. It will compound. I will improve. And the way that you, you do that is changing your metrics of success. When you draw something, you need to change the idea of good versus bad, meaning the default when we start drawing, we draw something on paper, and then we show it to mom and dad and say, look what I did. Is this good? And mom's like, oh, yes, that kitty cat is amazing. Or whatever you drew, the bison or whatever. I really liked drawing Vikings when I was like eight. I don't know why. But your mom and dad tell you, that's a good job. And so then we take that into school. We take that into high school. We take it into college. We're asking our professors, is what I drew good? Do you rate this? Is it good? Is it bad? And my pushback on that is, what does it matter whether I think it's good or bad? Like, what if I'm not your audience? Do I really care what you guys think about my work? If you're not in the soccer realm, like, I'm never going to make money off of you anyways. Like, what, is it, what does it matter? What, you don't like my work? OK, fine. Like, that's OK. You're not my audience. But the way to start measuring that is getting away from good versus bad to done versus not done. Did I do something today? Success. Did I not do something today? Failure. That's it. Keep the, keep the measurement that simple. Did I draw for 20 minutes today? I'm an artist. If I didn't, I'm not. Like, keep it so simple. And keep the times really low. Obviously, to get really good, you're going to have to put a significant amount of time. And 20 minutes may not be enough. But 20 minutes is a place to start, and that's how it's done. So going back, the formula is make cool work, show it to cool people, meet new people, repeat until you're dead. And that's it. Thank you. So I don't, I don't know how this is normally done. I don't even know what time I'm supposed to finish. Do we have like time for questions? 10 minutes, OK. And then we're getting like steak or something. I don't know, sushi. I don't know. My guy. A mistake I made, OK, related to art. <laughs> true, true. Um, somebody's trying to airdrop me. That's kind of you. Um, <laughs> I don't, if I accept it, it's going to screw up the presentation. Maybe later. A mistake I made when I was your age. Uh, the, the biggest mistake I made was in thinking that if I just had more time, I would be able to accomplish the project that I thought I would. And then summer would hit, I'd have the time, and I wouldn't create anything. It's like, big, that's the biggest fact. All of you guys are like, oh, can't wait till I have more time. <laughs> Just, like Igor, like, Argh! it's such a lie. You guys know it. Like, your life, whether you realize it or not, is the slowest pace it will ever be. It's only going to ramp up from here. You're going to have real bills. You're going to have spouses, you're going to have children like teething and ah, like there's going to be life. Right now you have the time and if you don't have the time, rearrange your priorities. That's just how it goes. But also understand where you're at in college. Like college is an amazing time to have fun. So have a good time, but get the work done. Yes. It's like a haiku. <laughs> Has my life enhanced my art or my art enhanced my life? This is a good question. I, I'm very bad at having boundaries. Like everything is just melted together. I love traveling, so I just figure out ways to apply it to art. And so in a way, it's like, well, I'm traveling to do art, but I love traveling. So is, is my art enhancing my life, or is my life enhancing art? It, it's like both, I guess. Um, I do know that I love people more than I love art. That's just a fact. If somebody's in the room, I'd rather talk to them than draw. So I would say life influences art. Final answer. Aspen, that's my girl. Go ahead. Um, where are your top five cards? What? Five? 
Top five priorities? Who, okay, be my wife. Uh, I'm trying to rate them, Aspen. We got my wife, obviously number one. If I didn't say that, I would be done. So we got Kels, of course. Uh, I think right now, as it goes, like, I love my team. I love the team that I have uh, back in Riverside. I mean, Jake's on it. I love, I love them. So I, I, in, in a weird way, like, I'm creating jobs to provide for my wife, but now I have this, like, fire, like, I want to keep employing them. So I want to figure out, how do I make more money? How do I get them more money? So that's, a, that's an honest, honest answer. Uh, the third one would be uh, church is a huge priority for me. I lead a small group. I help out with high school. And then fourth would probably be art. And fifth is like health and fitness. Yeah? I got it. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Yes? There is, I, so the greater motif or theme of my work is connecting with people. But as I was explaining earlier to, to some of the seniors, is I haven't done an amazing job at showcasing that in the actual work. In a way, I do feel like painting on the ground is full circle because when I paint on the ground, if I, if I showed that um, video back, there's kids skating on it. And so in a way, they're interacting with the work. And, and through that, they're connecting with me. And I love that, that meshing of where does the audience end and my work begin? And so that's kind of like where it's, where it's exploring. That's totally in hindsight. That's not something that I'm like actively like contemplating. Um, I am just creating. I'm very much all about quantity over quality. Like just always make more, just make stuff. Hit it, hit it, hit it. Uh, in the nature of that, I am constantly experimenting even though maybe to you guys it doesn't look like it. Because I am creating within a set style all the time. Like, you should be able to tell Jeff Covea drew this. But I am learning how to draw, again, uh, <laughs> 10 years after doing this, like, as a professional, this is just, I'm learning how to draw, again, relearning the basics, relearning foundation. And I do see my work starting to change. Maybe you guys don't see it, and that's okay. It's like subtle shifts that, that I think it will continue to grow in. So um, little things like the figure drawing. The next thing I want to get better at is perspective. Um, I've been working on rhythm within my work. I have always loved color. Just like it's very important to me that you just vibe with the colors immediately. Because public work, that's a huge thing. If the colors are wrong, they'll tell you. Oh, this doesn't look right. You're like, it, well, technically, it is right. But like, it has to be colors that people vibe with. So. Yeah, there's always constant little micro improvements. Any other questions? Yes. Have I ever thought about going Sistine Chapel on it and just hitting the ceiling? I did. So when I painted for Facebook, I did pitch that idea, like to do to do the ceiling. I ended up doing like the whole stairwell, where it was like an enclosed space. And my my thought was like, let's do a life size coloring book, like that that type of vibe. But I wanted to do the ceiling. It's just we didn't have the right scaffolding for it, and it just wasn't going to be it. So I think this, the ceiling is a, is a cool thing. But for me, it's more important. The ceiling is not as big of a jump from the wall as the ground is. The ground is a chance to interact with it. And I'm completely comfortable with when people walk on it, it does wear it away eventually. Like I'm using special paint that's expensive that is like um, for concrete specifically. But it will weather, and I'm okay with that. So, yeah, I'd be down for the, the ceiling. I don't want to think about what that'll do to my shoulder. Probably not good stuff. But painting on the ground is the move. Yes? Would you ever want to go back and touch up like, the past and want to just start to wear down on the ground, or do you want to keep painting? I have actually gone back and painted over many of my murals, like painted over them with new ones, and people get mad because I did that. But I began that barn, that first thing I would do is I would show up on a Monday. I would buff what I had painted the week before and then paint something new. At the end of it, I would buff it back to white. 
So I have never known a process of creating without really just like cycling through my stuff. I don't like interacting with the work I've already done. Like to me, every single piece that I've done, I, I see the mistakes. I don't see like the things that went right. I always see, man, this guy's arm is definitely wrong. And that, you know, that's just the curse of the artist, like always trying to be perfect, but okay. That's why I prefer painting far away because then I don't have to interact with it after, after that point because I would always like, want to change it. I would want to do that. And the idea of like touching up, I do have certain agreements with, with companies that like, like if somebody tags it, I'll come in for a certain amount to, to bring it back to life. Usually when you work with cities, they, they are really into that stuff. I don't know, most people don't care because most of, most of the time the murals don't get hit unless you're doing it in downtown LA and then it will get hit 100%. Any other questions? All right, you're all dismissed, all right? <laughs>